Let's now take a look at the establishment and development of the Morrill Land Grant Act and its subsequent implications. The time period is the Civil War. The year is 1862, right in the middle of the Civil War. The place, U.S. Congress. During 1862, the U.S. Congress passed three very important uh, acts uh, that played a key role both in the expansion of the United States westward and the rise, uh, of, and accordingly the rise of engineering in the United States. The first was passage of the Homestead Act, which offered 160 acres to any head of a family who would work five years in an unappropriated, uh, unappropriated lands uh, of the United States. And this initiated, as you may know, a substantial westward migration. Congress also chartered the Union Pacific Railroad to build a transcontinental railroad from Nebraska to California. Uh, the, up until that time, uh, the engineers were, lar were largely self-taught, and those self-taught engineers who had surveyed lands, built roads, canals, bridges, was no longer adequate to the task of a project of this scale and magnitude. It initiated a new demand for engineers with greater mastery of scientific resources. And the third was passage of the Morrill Land Grant Act, July 2nd, 1862 which laid the foundation for a comprehensive system of higher education and constituted really the first foray of the federal government into the area of public education. You should know, for example, that the Constitution reserved for the states all authority except for authority that the federal government specifically took for itself. And education throughout the history of the United States has been primarily the responsibility of the states. For that reason, there was considerable resistance from the states uh, to, to any ideas that involved federal support for education. This resistance came especially in the South, where states' rights were paramount, as you should know. Well, in 1862, the South was gone. The South had seceded. And Justin Morrill, the longtime advocate for support for public uh, federal support for public education, was able to make his move and get his interests uh, uh, greater visibility. Morrill himself had no college education. It's important for you to understand, for example, that he came from Ber Vermont, Vermont, a rural state, far away from the centers of power in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. For, uh, and, and yet he spent in the Congress, he had a term, uh, uh, he, had, uh, he served for upwards of 45 years. He felt that there should be a system of practical education for the masses, in part to help develop Western lands, but also to help develop rural areas in the United States, including Vermont. He was dissatisfied and expressed there was widespread dissatisfaction with the colleges of this country and the classical education taught in, in such colleges because such basically reproduced an intellectual and social elite in this country. Only the gentlemen, only the uh, wealth, uh, sons, especially sons of wealthy families had access to such colleges. His argument was we needed to reach out and in a way democratize education. And, a, and d he developed a unique concept for achieving this. As the act itself uh, uh, puts it, quote, it is an act donating public lands to the several states and territories which may provide colleges for the benefit of agriculture and the mechanic arts. Agriculture and the mechanic arts. And, and here's the vehicle through which the, the schools would get established. Again, quoting from the act itself. That stipulating, that there be granted to the several states for the purposes here and after mentioned an amount of public land to be apportioned to each state a quantity equal to 30,000 acres for each senator and representative in Congress to which the states are respectively entitled by the apportionments under the census of 1860. In other words, each state would get access to 30,000 acres of federal land for each a member of Congress. Now, if there, uh, and, and these lands were to be selected from uh, public lands inside the state that were available for sale. If such lands were not available, then the state was issued a land script 
the script was basically a voucher that it could cash in for uh, lands in unappropriated areas that were not either in a state or a formalized territory, namely out west. Also, uh, the, the act stipulated that mineral lands, lands with mineral uh, uh, resources, could not be used. Uh, the money from the sale of the lands or the land script was to be invested in stocks, stocks of the United States or of the states themselves, yielding not less than 5% uh, interest per year, with the goal of producing then a perpetual fund. This was a clever move because the uh, act was, uh, in a way, forcing uh, state matching money to get these colleges up and running. No funds were to be applied towards buildings. The states had to somehow come up with the buildings, only for operating expenses. They knew, for example, that there were many schools that would get started but couldn't continue because of, uh, in, because of high cost and insufficient income. In addition, the state stipulated that you had to be part of the United States. Quote, no state, while in a condition of rebellion, or insurrection against the government of the United States shall be entitled to, ben to the benefit of this act. So we have a nice system of granting land uh, as a, uh, that doesn't require drawing money directly from the treasury. Instead, it, it both um, um, increases development in unappropriated areas and gets people out there. Now let's get to the key provision that have to, has to do with education. Uh, I'll go through it, and then we'll go back over uh, some of the pieces. Quote, that all monies derived from the sale of the lands be invariably, without exception, appropriated by each state to the endowment, support, and maintenance of at least one college. So endowment, support, and maintenance, meaning basically operating costs. One college where the leading object shall be first-day qualification, without excluding other scientific and classical studies. In other words, what we're going to come up with here cannot exclude uh, the basically classical education uh, in the humanities, liberal arts, and some of the sciences. So that somehow must be included. What must also, and also, back quoting, and including military tactics. So the schools had to have a, uh, some sort of military training Remember, this is 1862. We're in the middle of a civil war, and no one has, a, has any sense of how long this war is going to last. And so if it's going to last a long time, these schools would contribute to helping um, build the, uh, rebuild the um, officers or provide a supply of officers uh, for the North. Back quoting, quote, to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts. Note these two areas, both of which were seen previously as somehow outside of the realm of higher education. Uh, and yet the supply, the, the, uh, the source of supply of, of especially boys here for this, these new institutions would come from farms and from shops uh, and f uh, occupied by members of the middle, uh, lower middle classes. Back quoting. In order, with the goal of, in order to promote the liberal and practical, note that, that both are there, liberal and practical education of the industrial classes and the several pursuits and professions of life. In other words, uh, the goal here is to expand education, uh, the, the realm, the, the purview of higher education for the masses in the United States. Traditional liberal education was not for the masses. There is a worry here that this would be seen as just purely practical education, and so the act stipulates that, uh, that these schools had to undertake both practical and liberal in, uh, education, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. The act, and specifically for the, uh, for the lower classes, what were described then as the industrial classes. This is very much part of the American style, providing uh, uh, low-cost goods for mass consumption, while well, providing education for mass use, uh, fits the style. The act was very effective. Within 10 years, by 1872, the year in which Virginia Polytechnic Institute and now State University was founded, the number, number of engineering schools in this country jumped from 6 to 70. Unbelievable level of expansion. 
Different states adopted uh, uh, different types of models in appropriating and using the funds because there was great competition for the funds in, in nearly every case. Some states adapted existing institutions. And as I list these states, think about what you now understand as the, as the, as the lead state uh, schools, uh, state universities. Inside of those states, and more than likely, you are thinking about the, the land-grant institutions. Those that adapted in existing institutions included Wisconsin, Michigan, Kansas, California. Some states used the money to establish entirely new schools from scratch. Some of these included West Virginia, Illinois, Maine, Indiana, and New York. Some, uh, uh, because of uh, political battling inside of the, uh, uh, inside of the uh, state legislature, split the money. Massachusetts, and to some extent, as you'll see, Virginia, some allocated the money to one school and then ended up moving it because of, of, of political haggling. Some of these included Connecticut and New Hampshire. After the conclusion of the Civil War, a number of southern states moved to add schools as well. And this includes Virginia, Georgia, Mississippi, uh, North and South Carolina. By 1885, the number of schools uh, falling under this act, uh, the number of schools offering engineering education with public support from states increased to 85. By 1917, say World War I, there were 125 schools. The act played a key role in the expansion of engineering education. Between 1870 and World War I, the, uh, the number, the annual, the annual graduation rate in engineering increased from 100 students per year to 4,300 students per year. And the relative number of engineers uh, in the population in general increased 15-fold. 